Recording in progress. Okay, Jason, uh, David, how are you? You know, almost here. Recording stopped.
Christi. And on behalf of the Epic Colloquium, we would like to welcome our delegations back to Tufts for the official opening of our simulation. So we were super elated to meet you all yesterday and super impressed with the passion and the knowledge that you all brought to the table. We hope that our discussions tonight continue to be fruitful and we have very high hopes for the solutions we come up with at the end of the simulation. Throughout this forum, we hope to hold productive er, discussion and debate surrounding climate change and see all the work that you all have been putting in throughout the year in action. Given that the climate crisis has been named Code Red for Humanity by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the global community can no longer treat the climate crisis as an impending threat, but an active existential peril, which directly impacts global peace, security, and our fragile Earth ecosystem. It is critical that we, as the newest generation in the political arena, push our members of government to set aside political differences and come together as a global community. Mitigating the effects of the climate crisis is only feasible if we act immediately and together, which while we still have the chance to do so. Luckily, there are many people working tirelessly to address these problems, trailblazing a path for others to follow in in addressing the critical threat of climate change. Today, we are lucky to host one such individual, Dave Cavell, an influential public servant who cu currently serves as senior advisor to John Kerry, President Biden's presidential envoy on climate. He will give the Hunter Farnham Inquiry Memorial Lecture, named in honor of another longtime public servant, an IGL advisory board member and an inquiry mentor. Dave Cavell has worked as a senior advisor and assistant attorney general for the state of Massachusetts, participating in many, many high profile cases. He also ran for a congressional seat during the 2020 elections for Massachusetts 4th District, worked as President Obama's speechwriter from 2015 to 2017, and most importantly, he was a Tufts gumbo. It's crazy. <laughs> so with that, I'll hand it off to you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Most of that is even true. Um, do I take my mask off? Do I leave it on? Are you sure? Uh, happy Friday, uh, and most of all, thank you for being here. Uh, this is a really wonderful program. Of course, I was incredibly honored to say yes as soon as I uh, got the opportunity to come back. Uh, the truth is I always uh, make a point of coming back to Tufts campus just because it's the best uh, university in America, that's why. Um, I'm also just, you'll have to put up with this, I'm just like overwhelmed that this building exists. This was a parking lot the last time I was on this campus, and this is very strange to me. Uh, but hello, hello. Thank you all so much for being here, and thank you for uh, putting me out of work, because you guys are gonna solve the climate change uh, crisis this, uh, this weekend, from what I understand, and we won't, uh, we won't need to worry about it anymore, which is a huge relief. Uh, so I'll just start uh, by doing uh, a few, uh, just ha uh, with a few slides uh, to go through sort of where things stand um, and, uh, and you know, how I've been involved uh, in this issue in my career. And then I figure we're gonna take some questions and please feel free to ask whatever you want, whatever's on your mind, uh, and hopefully I'll be able to answer some of it. Uh, so, the title of the presentation actually is, uh, is where I wanted to start, the what are we gonna do about it section. So the, it came to me at, a, at, a, at an interesting moment um, in my career. So this photo, this is gonna be the first of uh, a lot of photos uh, over the next 10 or so minutes that seem pretty much just like an excuse for me to brag about <laughs> places I've been and people that, that I've gotten the opportunity to work with. Uh, I hope it is mostly also uh, just a sense of how many wonderful people there are uh, who are working on these issues. So this photo seems like it should be one of those that I'm like really excited to be in and have blown up to this size uh, in my living room. Um, I, I, do, does anybody know uh, what room we're in in, the, in this photograph? Yes, yes, there you go, okay, good. Um, so, uh, I don't remember who he is, but this is the uh, current president of the United States, uh, Joe Biden. Um, but if you notice, uh, nobody 
in this photo, if you really start looking closely, a lot of people look pretty upset. Um, there's a number of people who are actively crying in this photograph. One of them is up there. I think Peter is crying over here. He's crying, Sana. Um, and uh, there is pretty much only one person in this photograph who is not crying, uh, and it's me. Um, and that's because I um, often found President Obama to be hilarious and could not help myself from smiling and laughing um, at his jokes, as corny as they sometimes were. Um, but this photo was taken uh, at a tough moment. It was the morning after the uh, 2016 presidential election. So this is Wednesday. Um, we had been up, uh, the speechwriters, we had been up uh, expecting to put the finishing touches on, on, uh, on the speech announcing uh, uh, the beginning of the transition to the Hillary Clinton presidency. Um, and at about three o'clock in the morning, we recognized that wasn't gonna happen. Uh, and so we got maybe two hours of sleep uh, and came back and continued to work on it that morning. Um, and the president heard that a lot of folks on the team were very upset uh, and brought us into the Oval Office to sort of talk about the moment uh, and give us his initial thoughts on what was happening. And he said a few things. Um, you know, he talked about in the way that he always does. I mean, it, it's sort of easy to be the easygoing Barack Obama uh, when everything's going well. It, to me, it was always more impressive that he was the same when things weren't going well. Uh, and this was an example of that. Um, you know, he talked about how, you know, if you were gonna give up the first or the second or the third time you were disappointed, you should never go into public service because you were always gonna be disappointed at times and you had to make your peace with that. Uh, but one of the things he said that always stuck with me uh, was that he said, you know, look, I'm, I wasn't gonna be president uh, in a few months no matter what happened in this election. And so, if you're upset, uh, and I can tell that a lot of you are, if you're upset about these issues, if you're upset about what's happening in the world, and if you want to make a difference, then my question is, what are you going to do about it? I mean, I'm not gonna be president. You all have an opportunity. A lot of you are just beginning your careers. What are you gonna do about it? And I want you to think about that. Uh, and you don't have to tell me right now, you don't have to tell me today, but take the week, take a few weeks, take the month, talk to people in your life that care about you and that you care about, uh, and think about what your answer could be to those questions. Uh, and so that was pretty impactful for me because I realized that was a question I'd always been asking. Um, now, again, in the days that followed, I mean, literally, I was laughing a lot in a lot of these photographs, and the people in my office in the days that followed would congratulate me on the impending Trump presidency. Uh, and so they didn't realize I was so excited uh, about this election. But um, what are you gonna do about it? I mean, that was a question that I'd been asking uh, at Tufts. It was a question that my parents had taught me to ask uh, from a young age. If I saw things in the world that I thought sh could be better, if I saw things that were unfair, my question should be, what can I, what can I do? Who, who can I help? Who's working on this issue? And can I be a part uh, of helping them? And so this was my first job uh, out of, out of uh, Tufts. Uh, I, I was in a program called Teach for America. This is me uh, wearing a Red Sox jersey in the South Bronx in New York, uh, about a mile from Yankee Stadium. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I went to be a fourth grade teacher uh, at a public school because I wanted to contribute. And, I, and you know, teaching is uh, a career that my mother had been in uh, before she became a lawyer. And it was something that had always uh, been something I'd, I'd considered. Uh, and it was a place where I felt like a lot of the other teachers were asking themselves that same question. A lot of them had gone in it because they wanted to educate. They wanted to, to help people. They wanted to be part of, of you know, educating young minds and, and, and doing good work. Uh, and that was a lot of what I saw. Uh, but a lot of what I saw was also that there were inequalities that weren't solvable, uh, in my opinion, one classroom at a time. As heroic a, a, as those teachers uh, were, and then my colleagues were, there were more students than desks in my classroom my first day. There were 32 students and 29 chairs uh, in that classroom. Uh, and the, the systemic inequalities, the systemic racism, the environmental injustice in the South Bronx in New York were, was obvious. 
Um, and again, I felt like my question was, what, do, what can I do about that? Um, and then I had an opportunity to um, work with somebody who I thought was going to, to give me some answers to those questions. So th this is somebody that I doubt many of you recognize. Does anybody recognize who this person is in this photograph of me? One person. Two people. Okay, yes. Who is that? Deval Patrick. And who was Deval Patrick? He was the governor of Massachusetts. Very good. Uh, yeah, so from 2006 until 2014, Deval Patrick was the governor of Massachusetts. Um, and these were the issues that he talked about. He talked about justice. He talked about equity. He talked about, you know, what we needed to do and could do together. Um, and in fact, he had a, a political consultant from Chicago named David Axelrod, uh, who said, you know, I think we can run campaigns a little bit differently. Um, he, you know, he gave us a slogan, together we can, uh, and he implemented a lot of, uh, a lot of strategies which um, became useful for the folks that I work for after uh, Governor Patrick. So this is another example of the fact that Michelle Obama just cannot take a bad photograph, apparently, um, and I can't take a good one. Um, but this is, uh, this was during that time that I had this incredible opportunity um, to work with uh, President Obama uh, and Mrs. Obama uh, in the White House. And there again, I realized that was the question that had brought both of them into this work was, you know, what can I do about it? What am I going to do about this? And President Obama talked about that a lot. That that's why he became a community organizer. That's why he wanted to work with other people in public service. Uh, and that despite the frustrations of the work, and often, as you probably remember, it was frustrating, deeply frustrating, that basic question drove President Obama to just say, like, okay, yeah, I'm still frustrated. We're not doing enough. So what are we going to do about it? What else can we do about it? What more can we do? Um, and so when that, when that administration ended, when that conversation ended, that's when I ended up working, uh, continuing to work in public service. I thought about taking a break, and I decided to, to stay in um, the work. Uh, okay, again, who is this that I'm sitting next to? That w me is the easy one. I'm going to give you that one. That's me. Who, who else is in that photograph? Who is, who is she? Again. Yeah, there's Maura Healy. And who is Maura Healy? She is Attorney General and, yes, of Massachusetts, and may in the future, she's now running for governor uh, of Massachusetts, uh, and may very well be governor. Um, but she was Attorney General of Massachusetts at this point, and was, that, that was a question that she and the lawyers in that office and in attorneys general offices across the country ask on a daily basis, because they have the opportunity to go to court uh, to overturn, for instance, the travel ban that President Trump uh, put into effect uh, in his first week in the presidency, um, to sue ExxonMobil and get them to reveal documents that show that they knew that climate change was real and happening as far back as the 60s, to sue opioid manufacturers. The list goes on. But every single attorney in that office, their job basically on a daily basis um, is to protect people and their rights. Uh, and so that attracted me to the office and, and, and kept me there. And it was a reminder that there are things that we can do if we work together, even on these enormous intractable issues. And then I realized, you know, a way to, to, to serve the public and to make a con contribution on these issues uh, is to run for office yourself. Uh, so I did, I did do that uh, and, uh, and put my own name on the sign. This is the last one of these swelters. Uh, does anybody know who the person on, again, I'm in the photo. That doesn't count. Who uh, is on the right-hand side of the photograph? No? Oh, two for three. That's, st that's, still, that's pretty good. Partial credit. So the, um, I, I just have this up there because I'm from Brookline and he's from Brookline. This is former Governor Michael Dukakis, who was the Democratic nominee for president in 1988. Um, and if you, like, go for a walk along the riverway near, like, the MFA um, and, and, uh, and Northeastern and Simmons, um, you will see Governor Dukakis, uh, as he normally does, take the walk along the riverway every morning to pick up trash and throw it away. So that's, that's just a 
quick facts about who Michael Dukakis is and, and what kind of person he is. Um, but that led me um, to this current role today. Um, again, this is, uh, I'll just give this one to you. This is John Kerry. Um, and this is us at, uh, at COP26 last fall. Um, it looks like we're having um, a really important conversation about the future of global climate change. We're actually discussing what time to have um, his press conference that night. But I'll, I think in the future, I'll just, I'll pretend that this is where we solve the climate crisis and that, that, that that's what the topic of conversation was. But it's the same question that, that um, Secretary Kerry uh, asked and that's why he ended up coming back into government to be in this office. It's the point of this office, which is what can we do about the climate crisis? That's a huge question, right? That's, th it's the same basic question, but that's a tough question to answer. Right, that feels like a bigger issue than any one person or one office or really even one country can solve. Um, so this is the, the place where we could go through and spend some time talking about climate science. I, I'm happy to talk about some of that despite the fact that I'm not a scientist and know less uh, uh, about how the mechanics of, of, uh, of climate science works than a lot of other people in my office do. But I, I think the fact is that we all know. Um, we all know that the climate crisis is real. We all know it's happening. We all know it's, it's devastating places of the Arctic and the Antarctic where it was 100 degrees above normal. 100 degrees above normal in the Antarctic two weeks ago. Uh, it's causing devastating floods, causing wildfires, and all of it hurting the people least prepared for it and most vulnerable to begin with, uh, as usual. Um, but I think it's interesting that here in the United States, we still, I feel like, are one of the few places in the world that has this debate. Is climate change real? Um, especially because it's already happening, right? I mean, we all know that storms are stronger, uh, heat waves are, are w hotter and worse and longer. Um, we all see that happening, that sea level is rising. It's happened within, within people's lifetimes. And to me, it really does feel like uh, a, an equivalent of asking, is, is the Earth round? And there are people, of course, who say, no, 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 the Earth is flat. Uh, but I think that that question should be um, viewed similarly um, because it's just not a debate. Um, this, is, this is one of, I think, uh, the most compelling charts because these presentations always involve them. Um, this goes back 800,000 years to show the carbon dioxide level, which you can tell from ice core samples. Um, over the past 800,000 years, uh, and that shows where we are now. So it's real, it's happening. Um, this is just another illustration of the point. This is what it looks like when we say 97 out of 100 climate experts think that human beings are responsible for what's happening. Um, just a visual representation um, of, the, of the consensus. So look, where are we? Here's the bad news. It's happening. It's devastating. The impacts are being felt in every country in the world, some more than others, uh, and they will continue. Um, we already lose something like 10 million human beings every single year because of extreme heat, extreme cold, uh, and air pollution. 10 million people every single year. And that will get worse. Uh, and we're not moving fast enough. I think. Uh, that's, uh, again, that's not uh, anybody's opinion, that's not uh, political, that's not, that, uh, that's not even um, controversial. It shouldn't be. Uh, the fact is we're not moving fast enough to respond and everybody who looks at the science agrees. But there's good news, which is that it's not too late. Um, what we have to do is limit total warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Now, this is, I think, part of the messaging challenge that we have here. Um, I have worked in communications for a, a number of years. 1.5 degrees Celsius doesn't seem like that lot, that, that much, at least to me. I don't know about you, but like one degree, one and a half degrees of global temperature rise, that doesn't seem enormous, but it is. This is the average global temperature and how much uh, it can rise based on the baseline, which is about 100 years ago. But the science says that if we limit total warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we can actually 
secure, a safer, healthier planet. We can actually still avoid the worst consequences of climate change. Not all of them, because some of them are already happening and baked in, but some of them, the worst ones. So the path to do that is to cut emissions by at least 45%, probably more like half this decade. Uh, and then we need to reach net zero. We need to get to a sort of pollution neutral, zero emission, net emission world by the middle of this century. So here's where we are. Um, as you can see, this is, uh, this is where we've been. This is the level of, uh, of emissions. Um, and this is where we need to go. So to get to 1.5, to get to the safe limit, that's what has to happen. And here's basically where we are at the moment. So again, the path still exists. It's not too late. We're just not there yet. Uh, and fortunately, after COP26, we're actually closer to this yellow line right now, and maybe even a little bit below it. But the problem is, of course, that it's that's based on what are we going to do? What are we going to do for the rest of the decade? Um, but we need, of course, to do even more. And that's what the rest of this decade is going to be about. That's what I hope your simulation this weekend will show us how to do. Um, because that's the question, is how are we going to do it? So this is just a quick illustration. There are lots of maps that, that show uh, similar views of, of the problem. Um, this is why when we say, you know, this is a problem that one country in the world can't solve. I mean, this is emissions by country. As you can see, there are a few countries, um, predominantly in Africa, that are not contributing significantly to the problem. Unfortunately, these are also the countries that are often most vulnerable to climate change and experiencing the worst impacts. Uh, something like 48 countries in sub-Saharan Africa alone only contribute 0.55% of total global emissions. 48 countries, 0.55% to give you a sense of, of the disparity and the injustice. Uh, and then there's the rest of the world. And everybody's part of the problem, but not necessarily equally. So there's a bunch of different ways to represent this. I don't know if this is helpful. I'm actually interested to know if this is helpful. Um, so let me just explain it for a second and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask. So this is all emissions, a representation of all emissions in the world. And then this is the top 10 countries. So as you can see, China, the United States, um, EU, obviously not a country, but they function as a collective, um, except when England decides not to be a part of it. Uh, India, Russia, right? So just to give you a sense of, uh, of where the emissions are currently coming from. Is this helpful? Yes? Okay. Uh, good. Um, so this gives you a sense of, of sort of where the emissions are coming from um, and who needs uh, and who's sort of whose actions would make the most difference. This is another way of representing the same thing. Uh, it's a little bit different, but it, it often we talk about the top 20 emitters, uh, and this is, this is a representation of that, because we talk about the G20. We the, there's often a lot of these groups that involve the top 20 economies in the world, um, and so this is just a representation of a few more of those countries, which you will see are part of the the conversation in, the, in, the, in a lot of these climate meetings. Um, but of course, this could change, right? And this is part of the problem that I think we can talk more about today, um, is that sometimes one of the arguments that you will hear and that probably will come up uh, this weekend is that a lot of the, um, the, one of the most common arguments that's made by some of these, these other nations um, are to countries like the United States, Germany, um, and the rest of the EU, is, well, look, you caused this problem. A hundred years ago, you were burning all the coal you wanted uh, before we knew about this problem. So really, this is on you. We should get to develop uh, and build our economies the same way that you did, uh, and, uh, and you should have to s fix a problem um, that you caused. That's a very simplistic way of describing this dynamic. Um, the problem is if you look at the graph and you look at the science and you, and you consider how many emissions are coming from how many countries, I mean, clearly that's not going to work. I mean, e if, if the United States, if we magically took every single car in America and in, in overnight just ch 
turned all of them into electric vehicles, if we just shut down every single coal plant in America, if we literally took every single emission to zero, that wouldn't get us there, right? This can only be solved through global action. So that's the challenge. So just quickly, uh, I won't go through uh, much of this, but I think that it's just important as context, you've probably heard about COP, did you hear, hear about COP26? Yes, 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 okay. So COP, the COP process, the conference of the parties, the process began, this actually wasn't a COP, um, but it began in 1992 in Rio. And I think it's telling that this is the largest photograph that I could find online, basically, from this photograph to give you a sense. This is also, does anybody know who this is? Yes, this is H.W. Bush, exactly. Um, so a Republican president, by the way, a Republican president of the United States went to this climate summit in Brazil in 1992 with John Kerry and a number of other Democrats uh, and said, climate change is real, we need to do something about it. They called it global warming, but um, people talked about how the climate was in crisis in 1992. And over the years, the, the process has gotten more robust. Um, this is the uh, this is from uh, Paris um, in 2015. Um, this is the Paris Agreement that some of you have probably heard of as well, um, and I'm sure you'll be talking about. The Paris Agreement finally set out some sort of rules of the road, and it was where all the countries uh, who are part of the, the COP, about 200 nations, uh, agreed like, okay, we'll all put out our plans for how we're going to cut emissions, um, and agreed that two degrees had to be the limit that we needed to limit total warming of the planet to, to, to two degrees uh, Celsius above the baseline. Unfortunately, science says that's not enough. Um, it's gotta be 1.5. Uh, two degrees is still terrible, terrible uh, impact, and we need to go further. So that's what Glasgow was about. And even in the progression of these photos, I hope you get a sense of how much more formal uh, this process has gotten and how much more time and attention has been spent on this, which I think is a good thing. Um, so this is, the, this is last November, this is uh, Alok Sharma, who was the, the, the UK uh, president of that COP. Uh, and then just to give you a sense of how strange these conferences are in some ways now, so this is like a, this is a, a giant warehouse and then every country has their own um, pavilion where they like, they like hand out local products and, and the South Africa pavilion had the best coffee of anybody at the event and so the lines were super long. And everybody like advertises their climate solutions and their climate products um, and gives out like little napkins and buttons and people try to collect them. It's very strange. But in some ways, uh, you know, a lot of people who are there, their reflection is, well, at least it's getting a lot of attention. Like at least Leonardo DiCaprio is here and, and like there's, there's press here as a result because, the, you know, people in the world are, are paying attention to this and, and making it a priority. So, um, this COP is where we agreed as a planet that 1.5 had to be a limit. So that's one of the big things that this COP did accomplish. It didn't solve the climate crisis. Uh, nobody expected that it would, but it was a real step forward. It talked about uh, fossil fuel subsidies for the very first time. That was mentioned in the statement um, from the COP. It elicited a lot of pledges on a lot of stuff from methane to deforestation. Uh, so I, I think just to sort of set the, the tone for for how I think about this issue, I really do think that the, the question that I've been asking all along um, about, you know, the question my parents have been asking me, the question that President Obama has been asking, what are you going to do about it? To me, I really do think that that is a, a we. What are we going to do about this? And I think that the hopeful message is there's still things we can do. There are things that we can do. We can avoid the worst consequences of the climate crisis. It's not too late. The fatalism on this issue, in my opinion, is not helpful. When people say it's too late, we're not gonna make enough progress. Um, because that's just not true. And in many ways, it, it lets us off the hook. It's still on us. It's, it's our responsibility to do something about this while we can. Uh, and then this is just uh, a photo that I love that uh, I close on just in this presentation. So um, this is a picture that shows that the earth is not flat. Um, but uh, but I, I I'm always, I mean, I'm sort of like a NASA nerd, um, but I always uh, love hearing astronauts reflect on their experiences uh, and about how 
when they're in space and they look down for the first time, right, th there's a phenomenon that NASA prepares them for and talks through with them because people often get so overwhelmed that they like forget about the thing that they're up there doing uh, and their mission. Um, because they get up there and they look down and they have this reflection about the fact that here's this entire infinite void of space uh, and then here's this very thin atmosphere, this just tiny little layer that protects the entire planet where everyone has ever lived. Um, and there's no borders from space, obviously. There's just the planet. There's just this one place where every single person and thing lives. Um, and I know, by the way, that the, this is powered by a solar panel advertisement for climate technology. Um, but I think it's a sense of like what we can do when we work together. I mean, this is, you know, one of my favorite statistics in all of human history is that the, the first human beings to fly, the human beings that proved that it was possible to, to break the, the bounds of gravity and actually to, to fly, uh, just sort of falling forward for a couple hundred feet with Kitty Hawk, the Wright brothers, they didn't actually meet him, but they could have, one of them lived long enough to have met uh, the first human being to walk on the moon. That's pretty wild. That's one human lifespan, or two, that overlapped. And we went from like falling uh, across some sand dunes in North Carolina to this. And so I just think, to me, it's a reminder that if we want to solve this problem, we can. It's just a question of whether we're going to try. So I hope we can talk about that. I hope we can talk about anything that's on your mind. So we're going to start with questions now. So if you guys want to line up and if you will follow along. Brave person, good job. Well done. Well done. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming here and having such a great time with us. And I'm Jose Mateo, and I'm here from uh, Columbia, Prep. Uh, Are you alone? Is anybody else from Columbia Prep here? Uh, I wonder. <laughs> Uh, my question, I guess, is that uh, even if we somehow come up with a, a strategy moving forward in addressing the climate crisis, how exactly will we be able to actually put through with that, go, go through with that plan to actually reach the position of, be in the position of power to be able to execute uh, what we envision to be our plan? Because, because in many sense, uh, currently there are many uh, plans in developing more renewable energy and as well as more adaptation and mitigation efforts. Mm -hmm. However, due to many of the lobbying that occurs within our government, as that it is just speaking for the United States, these policies have been difficult to carry out. Even the Green New Deal was cut back a lot from the Biden administration. So I guess my question would be, even if we have this strategy moving forward, how exactly are we going to execute? Yeah. This question, <laughs> how are we gonna execute? How are we gonna actually get these things done? Um, and look, I think the, the, the most on, honest answer is we don't know. Right. I mean, you're, you're right that, um, that we, you know, that going back to, the, to the, the slide about the good news, the good news is that we do know basically how to do this. We have a blueprint. We know what the steps are that we need to take. Uh, and to your question, you know, are, are we gonna do that? Are we actually gonna take those steps? Um, and and I actually, you did mention a couple things and everybody's probably incredibly familiar with, with these terms, but I just do wanna highlight adaptation uh, is one of the things that we're starting to invest in. So adaptation, um, as you probably know, means helping people adapt 
to, uh, to what the world is now, which is 1.2 degrees warmer, uh, and continuing to help people adapt uh, as it gets even, even warmer than that. The, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the most recent IPCC report, we just referenced uh, the IPCC uh, in the introduction, most recent IPCC report did warn us that we can only adapt to so much. You can adapt, you can help people adapt uh, in, uh, to a 1.5 degree warmer world. President Biden has a plan called PREPARE that's gonna help um, half a billion people adapt um, to climate change, but there's only so much adapting that we can do. But anyway, to answer your question, look, I, I think the answer to that has to be yes. We know what the solutions are and the, the, the answer to the question, are we actually going to implement them? It just has to be yes. It, it's unthinkable for us to not solve this problem, particularly when we can solve it, when it's solvable. And so the question is, if we don't currently have the political willpower um, in the United States and in other countries around the world, how are we gonna get it? And so I'd say we need to solve all of those issues and if necessary, one at a time. Um, and maybe that means registering more people to vote. Maybe it means preventing people from being kicked off voter rolls. Maybe it means prioritizing this as a political issue. Um, maybe it means continuing to put the pressure on public officials here and around the world to do more and to be more aggressive. It means letting companies know that this is uh, a serious consequential decision when people are purchasing products and that if the, the company isn't prioritizing this in the boardroom and in the, the products that they make and sell, uh, you're not gonna buy them. Uh, that you know we are seeing, the good news is, we're seeing an enormous amount of activity that's real. I mean look, I understand when people are skeptical about a lot of the companies that say that they're gonna do this, that, or the other, uh, but the good news is, uh, a lot of these companies, they're from, from what we can tell, from what they're committing to, they're very serious about this transition. They recognize uh, that this is unthinkable and you're not gonna wanna own stock in a shipping company in a world where the, the seas are unpredictable and there's constant storms. Uh, and so Maersk, which is one of the biggest shipping companies in the world, they just committed to buy their next eight ships are gonna be zero carbon. That's real, those are real ships that, are, that they've ordered uh, some of which don't even exist right now, but because of their order, they will. Uh, and so, you know, we just, we have to do everything in our power to make sure that we find these solutions and then we actually implement them. And some of the solutions are coming from new technology. Uh, we have to be careful about that because we don't want to imply that there's gonna be some magical machine that's gonna suck all the carbon out of the air and solve the climate challenge for us. That's not gonna happen. Uh, I mean. That's not gonna happen. There's a tiny, infinitesimally small chance that that could potentially happen someday, but I don't think we wanna bet the future of the planet on it. Uh, and the good news, again, is that there are things that are within our power right now. The IPCC, the scientific body, they were very clear about this. The technology that we need to solve the climate crisis exists right now, and we can do it. So I think, uh, you know, are, are we gonna get there? That remains one of the biggest questions facing the planet. But I do think that we, uh, we have overcome prior crises in the past. We have the capacity to do it. It's hard to find uh, somebody, thankfully, at this point. I mean, they exist, but it's hard to find somebody, in my experience, who doesn't think that this issue is dire and critical and important. And so I think that that tells us we can do this. I mean, we just need to, we need to find the willpower. Uh, and so I guess that's, that's what I would say about it. Thank you. Sure. Hello. Hello, uh, my name is Shahil Shankar and I'm with Pace Academy in Georgia. Oh, welcome, welcome from Georgia. Yeah, um, so I wanted to go back to what you said about uh, there still being people who think climate change is real, how it's still a discussion and how that, even if the amount of people is small, how it like hinders the movement towards climate change. Yeah. Um, I think most most of us can agree that topics like climate change and vaccines and COVID like shouldn't be politicized, <laughs> but unfortunately they still are. Yeah. And so my question would be, how do you think we should depoliticize these types of topics and essentially convince people that it's not, it shouldn't be a political topic, that it's something that no matter your political standing should be looked at the same. Yeah, this is another one of the really important and really good 
uh, and really difficult to answer <laughs> questions. Uh, and again, if we knew that, uh, I think we'd be in, in better shape. Um, and, you know, uh, it feels a little um, trite to reference a Leonardo DiCaprio movie, um, <laughs> but I'll do it anyway. Um, but, but, right, like, they illustrated this, this problem in, in Don't Look Up, uh, which is on Netflix. They illustrated this challenge. Um, and, yeah, I think that there's a lot of relevance to something like COVID, where, you know, there, there is a certain percentage of the population that won't look up if there's a comet headed toward the planet that will say, um, you know, COVID isn't real, the virus isn't happening, don't need to wear masks, et cetera, don't need to, you know, this, that, and the other, and we'll say it about the climate crisis. I think um, what, what often is effective in these conversations, A, is recognizing that that is not a majority viewpoint. If you look at public opinion surveys in this country, that is a minority viewpoint, that climate change is not real or that the science isn't settled. Um, and so know that going into those conversations, um, even if the person who's saying it is unfortunately an elected official. Um, know that that is, a, that that is a, a small and declining percentage of people who think that. Um, and then I think what I try to do is back up and say that this is not a disagreement and try not to have an argument where I'm on one side and they're on the other and say, you know, look, unfortunately, science doesn't care um, what side of this argument we're on. The planet doesn't care what side of the argument you're on. This is happening. Uh, and it's happening in people's lifetimes. Um, and I think when you show them the evidence, when you approach it as much as possible, sort of from just a calm, explanatory point of view, you're not going to persuade everyone, right? There's some number of people who think the world is flat, who think that we didn't land on the moon. Um, but we don't need to convince every single person to do that. And I think the more that you can just share like the actual experience of living on a planet, the concerns that you have, and say, well, here's why I'm concerned about the climate crisis, uh, and, and explain that you know, this is living, this is within a lifetime. This is our generation. This is our experience on this planet is going to be really bad if we don't do more about this. Um, and I also try to emphasize to people, even if you don't believe that this is happening, do you really think that we should rely on a country like Russia for our oil and gas? Or do you think that we should use the power of the sun and the wind to power our homes? Like, even if you don't believe that, that this is real and that this is a problem, do you want the air that your children to breathe and the water that they drink to be clean or not. Um, and, you know, this is part of the, you know, what I think is so um, frustrating, of, of course, about this issue, is that there's really no argument against any of this. I mean, it's such a good investment. It's so obvious. It's so clearly the thing that we need to be doing um, that it's hard to find a rational explanation for why somebody wouldn't be on board with it, even if they didn't believe any of the science. Uh, and so I think that it's just about having more of those conversations um, and mobilizing and empowering more of the people who can speak to that experience that they are living right now. Um, you know, the people it, along the Gulf Coast that are being impacted within the United States, those, that storytelling I think is really powerful, especially in oil and gas communities. I thought, you know, there, there's a lot of things that we can do. There's a lot of things that we can do. There's a lot of stories we can mobilize. And whatever works is what we need to do. Because again, we can't lose. This is a, this is, it's not a question of whether we're going to win the fight. It's just going to be how we're going to win it. Uh, and one person at a time, one election at a time, one issue at a time, one bill at a time, if need be. Thank you. Yeah. I'm yeah. Jennifer Lee, and I'm from the very spirited Columbia Prep Group. And I was wondering, you mentioned in your presentation a little bit about the simplistic argument about telling lesser developed nations not to industrialize as much. I was wondering if you could talk more about the hypocrisy of that and what you would say to a less developed nation who might have to emit more carbon emissions, but how can you tell them not to do so? Right. So this, again, this is a huge challenge. Um, and, and, I, and I don't at all mean to be flippant uh, about countries that are developing um, and 
are concerned that they're not going to be allowed to develop uh, at the expense uh, of, uh, you know, of, of jobs and livelihoods and, and quality of life for, for people in their country. Look, I mean, I, I think the, the first thing is that we all just have to agree as a baseline that no one is going to want to live on a planet that is 2 degrees, 2.5 degrees uh, or more warmer. Nobody's, nobody wins. Everybody loses on that planet. Um, and particularly in these, in these developing nations, a, as usual, um, it, you know, the impacts are going to be awful and devastating uh, for, for people uh, in their countries as well. And so, um, so we start with that acknowledgement. And then we say, and look, the, the developed countries can help. Um, and they can help mobilize financing. They can help come in and, and figure out where it does make sense to invest in developing the renewable energy infrastructure in a country, right? Where there are companies that can invest and build a solar plant or offshore wind or whatever the case may be. Um, and are doing that increasingly. Um, and then I think some of it as well is showing the, the cost trends. I mean, the price of solar and wind is dramatically declining. You're not going to want to own a coal plant in 20 or 30 years. You're not going to want to, to and, and this is why this is off the record, um, you're not going to want to own a, a natural gas facility in 20 or 30 or 40 years. You're just not going to want to because those are not going to be cost effective. Nobody's going to want to invest in those. Nobody's going to want to pay for that energy um, when solar and wind and hydro and everything else is just so, so much radically cheaper. Uh, and more effective, and you don't have to rely on other countries to do it. And so I think what we most of all say is this is not, th it's a false choice to think that you have to either develop or combat the climate crisis. The answer is that you can do both. You can do both. And, you know, it's up to everybody in the world to make sure that every country can do both. Um, but this is not a choice that should be or needs to be put to any country anywhere. Um, and the question is just, what do they need and how can we help? Uh, and that's part of what the COP meetings are about and that's part of what we, that's part of what we need to do. Thank you. Uh, just in the interest of time, can we start asking questions two at a time and then? Oh man, yeah. this is a challenge for yeah. me, but I'll, I accept it. Your memory, accepting yeah. your memory. Hi, uh, firstly, thank you so much for your speech. Of course. Margot Kramer from Columbia Prep. And my question touches on um, responsibility and on incentive. I've noticed a disappointing trend of the individual thinking, oh, I don't have nearly as much impact on the environment as, say, for instance, an oil company who's known about climate change for 30 years, not done anything. So firstly, how can we incentivize the individual, the consumer, versus the uh, corporation or the government? And secondly, how do we deal with the incentive of short-term or current profit versus long-term, much smarter investments in more eco-friendly or climate change combating energy? Yeah. Not even energy, just largely. Yeah. Okay, wait, we're taking two? Okay, so you go ahead. Okay. And I'll find a way of answering both of them. My question's sort of a very different um, area. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, How dare you? Um, Sorry, go ahead. I'm uh, Henry Kramer. I'm also from Columbia Prep. We're twins. Um, my question is about um, <laughs> sort of what role should fossil fuel companies um, play and what role do they play in the climate change, um, in the fight against climate change? I noticed that one of the uh, like cita citations you had was from BP, and though I certainly think um, they can be helpful in aggregating data. Certainly, wouldn't they have short-term profit motives, as my sister said, in, um, in mind? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, this is, okay. So, the answer to, um, well, I think the answer in some ways can be linked. Um, so, the, the question is, like, what, what are you going to do? It? What, are, what are we going to do about it collectively? So the, the answer to the first question is everybody um, bears responsibility, right? Because like the thing that every single person on this planet shares is that we live on this planet. And all of us have to breathe the same air, drink the water, live on a planet that's healthy. Um, and so we all have an equal stake. Uh, and so, you know, I think that, that it, it is insidious and it is real uh, on this issue and on lots of issues that people feel cynical and feel like one person can't make a difference and it's not worth trying. Um, and certainly there are people who, through their own privilege and many other reasons, 
have more of an ability um, to make an impact. And those people need to be held accountable and need to be told, this is what we need to do and here's how we need to do it. Um, but I think it's also, I hope, empowering to know that calls to your representatives at every single level of government really matter. I mean, really matter. Not so much if you're from Massachusetts calling Kentucky or calling a representative from another state, but your city councilors, your state representatives, your state senators, they listen. When you call and you say, we expect action on this, they listen. Uh, and I think movements like the Sunrise Foundation and others have done a very good job of just demonstrating that people listen when there's committed, concentrated efforts. Um, and so I guess what I would say to people is like, everything matters. We're not at a position where you can say like, well, in the, you know, these oil and gas companies, there's so much more to blame. So like, it doesn't, we don't need to recycle. We don't need to, whatever. The problem is, unfortunately, everything does matter. Even little incremental progress matters an enormous amount right now when the, the stakes are literally the future of the planet. And then the question about like, how are these companies gonna be a part of the solution? Um, they have to be. Uh, the, you know, the, you're right that some of the data that we have has, has um, certainly not been taken at face value necessarily in every case, right? The question will be like, well, does that fit with the modeling from other scientists and this, that, and the other? But the fact is, you know, like the every, well, I don't wanna say every, but many cars in the parking lot tonight, they're still based on gasoline. And the power for this building I hope in part comes from renewable sources on this campus. Um, but if you look at the energy mix, even in a state like Massachusetts, fortunately a lot of that is still fossil fuel produced. And so there is going to be a transition. And I think what the Biden administration um, has said very clearly to the fossil fuel companies is like they need to be a part of the solution. Um, and part of that means uh, simple things like plugging methane leaks. That's a huge deal. Plugging methane leaks this decade uh, and reducing methane emissions alone could prevent 0 0.2, 0 0.3 degrees of warming. And so they absolutely can be a part of the transition. And I think part of the argument when you're talking to a company that's profit-based um, is, yeah, short-term thinking is a really bad idea. Um, and part of this, I do think, is about convincing the boards, again, you will not be able to sell energy in a world that's in chaos because of climate issues. It's not going to be profitable. It's not gonna be a good investment and your shareholders will hold you accountable uh, if your company all of a sudden isn't profitable because the planet is collapsing and your shipping lanes are collapsing and you can't extract any of this energy anymore. Uh, but I think ultimately what we need to do is move to a totally clean economy, right? That's what science says. And again, th this is part of the, the illustration that we have to do. It's not what I'm saying. It's not what President Biden is saying. It's not really just an opinion. It's just a fact, we have to move to a clean economy. And so the question is, how are we gonna do that? And I think the answer is everybody needs to be a part of it. Uh, and that'll take a number of different forms, but it's a necessity to get to the climate goals in time. We're gonna need everybody to, to be working on this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Chelsea. I'm from Columbia Prep as well. Um, <laughs> How many people are not from Columbia Prep? <laughs> okay, okay, good. There's a few of you here. Good. Wow. Um, but we're the best. No, I'm kidding. Um, so, um, my question is on behalf of my delegation, the African Union. Shout out, uh, best delegation. Um, I, in your presentation, you talked about how a lot of African nations, they're being um, affected almost like the worst, mm -hmm. um, even though they contribute the least to emissions. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Leah kind of brought this up earlier, but how are they supposed to act now if they kind of they do need to develop for the well-being of their citizens, for the well-being of their economy, but they also do want to help and they feel that like they're not given the um, as much of as much of a voice as they should be given. So like how just like what can they do? Yeah. So oh wait, we're taking two, right? Okay. And so your question. Hello, my name is Rehan Rahman, and I'm also from Columbia Prep. No shocker to you. Yes. So uh, my question is, um, you know, like within the span of an hour, we're all supposed to be negotiators. So <laughs> should our focus primarily be on persuading members of government or members that technically have like power in like creating action, or should our focus be on educating 
like the people of a nation and ensuring that the public opinion of a nation is favorable to action towards climate change? Good questions. Um, <laughs> so, good questions. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, let's try to answer them in some ways together. Um, look, I think um, you have to recognize the dynamics in every country. Um, and every country in the world, of course, is, is facing a unique set of circumstances, has, a, has its own population, its own concerns, and is, and is to some degree, of course, self-interested, right? I mean, that, that, that's just the nature of the world. Um, but that's also an opportunity. And so uh, I think a lot of African nations, for instance, uh, at COP uh, and elsewhere, are really leading the way. Um, so Rwanda and Senegal, um, have really demonstrated a lot of the adaptation practices that we are adopting globally um, because they're figuring out how to help small farmers plant better seeds that are going to be resilient to rising temperatures and less predictable rainfall patterns. Um, or they're building roadways accounting for the fact that like a, a roadway that right now is not built in a river may be in a floodplain in 20, 25, 30 years. Um, and so I think that's part of what they're doing. And then also, we're forming partnerships in recognition of this reality, which is that as you go forward, this is why uh, developed countries have this collective goal uh, of mobilizing $100 billion annually in funding to help countries um, invest in adaptation and, and mitigation strategies. Um, and this is part of President Biden's plan, which will help people adapt as well. So, you know, you're absolutely right to identify that this is a challenge. Um, but I do think that there's a lot that can be done. Um, and also, I think, organizing a collective voice, um, kind of in the same way that we were talking about the Sunrise Foundation or the movement uh, and others. The, um, there's a group called the V20, which is the vulnerable 20, the most uh, vulnerable 20 countries in the world to the climate crisis. They're actually meeting next week, um, I think. And when they release a statement together, that's actually um, a little bit more powerful and influential than it would be if just one uh, were um, advocating on their own. So much in the same way that I think somebody like the, uh, an organization like the EU has really collectively mobilized Europe's voice, even if they have internal <laughs> disagreements, um, I think that uh, collective action can be powerful, even on the, the sort of national global level. Um, and so I think that that's how, in part, I would answer the question about how you approach these negotiations. Um, start from a position of what's our goal, uh, and then break it down into region and country if you have time, um, and figure out like what is our goal. I mean, look, for, if you're in Europe, well, Europe is on board for the most part, for the most part, um, with, with this issue. Um, Europe, European uh, nations, uh, their public is on board with the issue. They're moving quickly. They're slashing emissions quickly. They're investing in renewables. Um, of course, not as fast as, as we all need to be. Um, but so that's a different conversation. And the goal there is different. And so I think what I would consider is sort of what we, um, what we uh, try to do at, at, at COP and what we try to do generally uh, is divide up that strategy and figure out like, okay, who's gonna be our lead with this region? Um, who's gonna be our lead with South America? Who's gonna be our lead with East Asia? Who's gonna be our lead on this? And then maybe you wanna have another issue, right? I mean, methane is one of those fast-acting uh, climate pollutants. Uh, we can get a lot of impact on warming right now um, if we turn off methane emissions. So maybe you wanna think about having somebody who like, that's just their thing and they wanna go around and figure out how to convince some group of nations to act on that issue. Uh, but anyway, so I, I think that's, that's part of the answer. It's just like everybody has to be a part of the solution. Everybody can be a part of the solution and the question is how are we gonna make that possible? Uh, and we all have to make that decision uh, in a way that's strategic, but there's lots of right answers, I guess, is the good news to that question. Mm -hmm. Time. Yeah. Um, I'm Margaret Bowles. I'm from Dover Sherborne. My question. Congratulations. Here we go. Finally. Yeah, I love Dover Sherborne. Well done. Well done. Um, my question is about the <laughs> international versus national debate that we have about climate change. Uh -huh. So in the United States, we talk a lot about um, both fatalism and nihilism, which are <laughs> yeah. both like not helpful. <laughs> right. Do those play out in the same way on the international stage as they do on our national stage? 
Great question. Um, no. I think it's fair to say, not entirely, but no. The denialism is mostly an, an American. I don't want to totally say this out loud. Again, this is off the record. But it's predominantly an American phenomenon. There are, of course, leaders around the world who say that the climate crisis isn't real. There are, of course, people around the world that you could find who will say that they're not worried about it and it's overblown. But as a, as a dynamic in our politics, I think that this is something that we face in the United States uh, more than in most uh, other nations. Um, and fatalism uh, and cynicism is common to every country and community in the world, unfortunately. Um, and again, not just on this issue, but on so many issues. Uh, and it's one of the things that President Obama would talk about all the time. Uh, is that the, you know, the cynicism in many ways uh, was the most dangerous enemy, he felt like. Um, because more than, uh, in the same way that disinformation, disinformation isn't just, you probably know this, isn't just about putting fake stories out. It's making you feel like you can't trust anything or anyone because you don't know what's true. There's, it's just an overwhelming amount of different points of view that make you throw your hands up and feel like, this is, I can't get engaged, this is too complicated. And so I feel like that's, it's the same thing with cynicism. The, the, the problem is, is it leads to apathy and it makes you feel like, well, there's nothing I can do, there's nothing one person can do. Um, and that's a challenge uh, in a very real way. Um, but I think that's why we need to do a better job of advertising what we are doing, being excited about the solutions and about the possibilities they offer and about the better world that we can get that all of us will benefit from. Uh, and uh, overcoming that, um, that dynamic generally. I mean, I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we face just as people, as human beings in the world, is to like wake up and feel hopeful and optimistic about, uh, you know, about lots of things. Um, but I think it's really worth it. It's, it. it's the only way that you get people to keep doing these, these incredible jobs that, I, that I've gotten to see a little bit of in my career. It's how you get people to invest in programs like this and be here and be a part of this work. Um, and the, uh, all I'll, the last thing I'll just say is that the, like, I feel like nobody has a worse record of accuracy than the cynics. Than, what? than the cynics. <laughs> cynics are always wrong. Always, always, they are always wrong. They, th th they were the people who were like, we'll never land on the moon, it's a pipe dream. We'll never, you know, Biden's never gonna win the election. It's a pipe dream, it's never gonna happen. Don't waste your time. Like, they're just like always wrong. And individually, they might have some examples where they're right and like the Yankees win the World Series one year and it's awful. <laughs> but over the long term, they're just always wrong and I think um, President Obama, the last thing I'll say about this is like one of his favorite sayings, which people can disagree with, but spoke to me, was that better is good. Um, and better really is good. Like, you know, people all the time would say like, your healthcare plan wasn't perfect, we should have had a single payer healthcare system. Well, some people would say like, you're a crazy communist and you wanna kill my grandmother. But <laughs> reasonable people, people that I consider reasonable would say like, oh, well, we should have had a single payer healthcare system. And he would say, you're right, but better is good and tell 26 million Americans that have health insurance that it's not worth it and this wasn't, this wasn't a good effort. Like, you know, the people that aren't dying because of a treatable disease, like, they're better is good for them. Uh, and so I think that's one of the things that I've had to come to terms with in politics is like, you're not gonna get everything you want right away. Um, but reflect on the progress because it's meaningful and it matters to people um, and it's the only way that we get things done. Sorry, I messed that up. That was supposed to be two questions. Okay. Hi, I'm Arabella from Dover Suburb. And um, I... Very positive, very supportive. I just wanted to ask, um, would you mind giving us a summary of, in layman's terms, of what was said at the COP Glasgow conference about um, energy government subsidies? About subsidies? About, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, this was one of the big things that happened at COP was that um, uh, governments uh, finally, for the first time ever, said that we needed to um, uh, address the fact that governments around the world subsidize um, oil, gas, uh, and coal. So 
Um, in a nutshell, <laughs> to the, I mean, I was gonna say to the extent that I remember this, but unfortunately I do remember all of this even though like some of this was happening at three in the morning. Um, what we would have liked to say uh, is um, we need to phase out those subsidies. Because right, like every single word of this text is something that like literally in rooms like this one, there's, you know, it's like model, I mean, it feels a little silly to say it's like model UN because it's basically the UN, but it's, you know, there's a representative from every country in the world and they're all arguing about every single word, especially of these kinds of sentences. Uh, and so there was public reporting about this. So I'm not divulging anything super secret, but there were a couple countries that objected to phase out uh, subsidies, not the United States. Um, one of them is a country in East Asia, one of them is a country in South Asia. Um, they're very big. They're the most populous countries on the planet. And they said, uh, no, we are developing. Phasing out all of this energy is not possible uh, in the short term. And they, um, and they uh, uh, suggested a change. It became a subject of a lot of debate um, at the COP. Uh, but I think as, as, uh, as Secretary Kerry has said many, many times since then, and, and back to the point of better is good, um, the, the language that uh, was agreed to was um, they need to phase down these subsidies. Uh, and I think Secretary Kerry's point was, well, you have to phase down something to phase it out. I mean, that's, you know, that's the trajectory. Once you're phasing it down, well, where does, where does that head? Once you're on this path, where's that going? It's, so, uh, yes, so anyway, so the, this was a big deal, that we'd never been able to get 200 nations in the world to, to um, agree that collectively we needed to do this. So that's a sort of short nutshell version of what ended up coming out of the statement. And then there was a whole bunch of other actions that were taken and commitments and pledges and whatever uh, about how to do that uh, and what would replace it, but that's a longer answer. Thank you. Yeah. I can hear you. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'm from Boston Latin School. Boston Latin! <laughs> Oldest school in the nation. Uh, my name is Joshua Rend. And uh, you've talked a lot about COP26. And well, I think there were definitely a lot of good things that happened there. I've also heard a lot from uh, youth act activists and minority activists as well uh, that not a lot or not a lot that was significant was done. Not enough was done. Mm -hmm. I believe Greta Thunberg gave a speech in Milan about this, mm -hmm. the blah, blah, blah speech. So what would you say to that? Like, how do you think we can convince young people to believe in world leaders of today, that they will actually do something to help with the climate crisis? Yeah, look, it's a good question. And look, I don't, uh, the, the first thing that I wanna say is I don't wanna try to convince anyone of anything. I think that, especially on this issue, talk can be cheap and we need to see action. Uh, that's just, again, it's not political. It's not, that's not controversial. It's just a fact. We need to see action on this. We need to make progress on this as a planet. Uh, and so what I would say is uh, I know that people are frustrated um, and I'm frustrated too. But the fact remains that we live in the world in which we live. And the way that things get done is often frustratingly slow. Um, and we need to find ways of picking up the urgency. And everybody has a role to play in that. And it goes back to the, to the, to the point that was made before, which is cynicism is not helpful and it's not useful. We can and have to win this battle. Uh, I think you know, the, the actions uh, that were committed to at COP, some of them were really were really important and meaningful. Um, we, of course, do need to see more across the board, um, of obviously in climate justice, obviously in environmental justice, obviously in the urgency of action globally. Every single country in the world needs to move faster. Uh, and so I think what I would say is, um, is keep it up. I mean, the, you know, adults need to act like adults. The people in these rooms who have responsibility need to act like they do um, and act like the future of the planet is, is at stake. Um, and, you know, they're held accountable by us, by, by people. And 
the good news is that like, at least from my perspective, the people that I was in the room with, the people in the United States delegation, the people that we were working closely with in you know, the Canadian delegation and the European delegation, the African delegations, like nobody is there because they just wanna pay lip service to this issue. Everybody has committed their life and career to this work because they care about it and because they recognize the stakes. And so, you know, we just need to find a way of, of solving one of the biggest challenges in the history of human civilization together um, in a very short amount of time. Uh, but again, that sounds big when put that way, but it's achievable. We, this is something that we can do. So uh, look, I think it's great that, that people are, empow are empowered uh, and that especially young people um, have taken a leadership role uh, in mobilizing public activism on this issue. I think that's great. Um, and uh, I hope it continues. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Maya. I'm from, as you can probably guess, Columbia Prep. Um, and I wanted to ask about equity of voice because as we've already discussed, the African Union only contributes about 4% to the mm -hmm. total carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and as you mentioned, at, place, at conferences like COP26, they are presenting plans and strategies to fix a lot of these issues. And they're presenting plans that will actually work and that will actually be effective, and yet we're not seeing them carried through. And I know that one of my other classmates already asked about the political aspect of it all, but I was wondering in your line of work, how much of the conversation was actually dedicated to making sure that these countries' plans and strategies were actually being implemented? And if it wasn't, which is totally fair, Whose job is it to make sure there's more equity of voice in these conversations? Yeah. And before you get to that answer, can we have one or two other students? Oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, um, I was wondering, uh, while I understand that all countries have to contribute to try resolving climate change, what do you suggest to um, developing countries who don't really have the resources to spare to contribute to the matter? Mm -hmm. I think, well, like, it's kind of obvious that there are, like, a few countries with a lot of privilege that are, like, dominating the climate movement. Um, and I think usually those countries aren't, like, the most impacted by what's actually going on. Um, and I, I'm just wondering, like, to what extent do you think the climate movement would be different if the countries, like, without really a voice were prioritized? Okay, so this, these are actually related questions. Uh, okay, uh, and, and it makes sense. I mean, this is a question that I think all of us need to ask um, and is at the forefront of a lot of these conversations um, is, you know, who's, who's, uh, who's being given a microphone? Who's, who's allowed to speak in these, in these conferences and at these COPs? Who, who's empowered, who has agency? Um, which of course is a problem in a lot of issues, uh, it, domestically and also internationally. Um, I, well, to, to answer the question about like whether, whether a platform is being given to those countries, um, I think that's been part of the process um, and I certainly don't, wouldn't wanna speak for those nations. Uh, I will say that the, you know, after um, the four-year gap when the United States had pulled out of the Paris Agreement and had pulled out of every international uh, convening, um, President Biden has been very intentional about um, having the United States engage with and give a platform to um, other nations. So like there's a, the, at COP, one of the sessions is with um, the, the island vulnerable nations. Um, and so um, the United States is, uh, it, it, they welcome other countries to join. Uh, and so the United States and the European Union joined so that those countries could be um, given a platform, heard from, um, they chair the meetings, they lead the discussions, they decide what the topics are. Um, and the more COP members are a part of any one group, the like, it, that's sort of how it works, is like if you have more people in your group, you're, you know, you get, you get more of the uh, time because everybody is competing with each other um, to talk about the issues that are important in their region. Um, and it's absolutely true that the, the outrageous um, 
consequences of the climate crisis are falling on these climate vulnerable nations, many of whom are not committed, emitting as many emissions. Um, even though, as we say, every country in the world, even if the impacts aren't evenly distributed, every country in the world will suffer, is suffering um, from the changing climate. And so, you know, I think that the, this is something obviously that, that needs to happen more. Um, there needs to be more attention paid to the, to the plight of nations that are already um, experiencing climate disasters on a daily basis. The, that's why actually um, I am not going, but Secretary Kerry is leaving tomorrow to go to an ocean conference, which has, they've, we've decided to hold, uh, I say we as the collectives that are part of this ocean conference, hold in um, Palau, which is a small nation in the in island nation in the Pacific. This is the first time this conference is ever being held in uh, a small island nation in the Pacific, and reporters and, and, uh, and journalists and, and ministers from around the world are all coming to this island to talk about what's happening there. Um, and, you know, it, in terms of what would happen if all nations agreed, like what the mechanism would be to get all nations to agree to the solutions that are being proposed by these other nations, this is the, this is the challenge of all of this work, in my opinion, is that it's very hard to act unilaterally. Even if you know what the right answer is, it's very hard to get the whole world to act uh, and to get other nations to act unless you convince them that it's in their own self-interest to do so. Um, and you would hope that the compelling evidence from science uh, and that the collective mobilization of most of the world uh, helps do that. And we're trying to put in place incentives that help uh, expand the urgency and make people recognize that time is running short and that everyone will suffer. And developed countries have committed to do more than they're currently doing uh, to help developing nations adapt to uh, what's happening already and also to grow in ways that are clean and that are green and that are sustainable and, uh, and keep the planet and their nation healthy. Uh, but we need to do more. And I think everybody would agree with that. And this is one of the big questions that we face, is will we? I mean, here we are. I'll try to say what I can say about this. Um, it does feel like an issue where we need to lead by example um, in the United States. We have the capacity to do that. Um, and I certainly hope that Congress moves quickly to do so. But we all have a role to play. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and